I think we might should just get started. People are anxious to get on the road, but I think they're even more anxious to hear Zig talk, and they're even more anxious for the grand prize door prize drawing of the uh, tuition to next year's conference and one week here at the Hilton during that week. But first, for those that entered the uh, rocket math door prize drawing, we'll get that one out of the way. <clears throat> I was set up on this one. Oh, the person actually, okay. Looks like we have a Louise Clark winning the, is Louise here? Louise must be present to win. And she's not here. Ooh. The excitement builds. This is by uh, email address. Is there an S. Sanborn at fpsschools.org? No Sanborn. Let's, oh, here we go again. This is okay. This would be the email address is barbeb at uw.edu. No? Yes? Yay! I'm excited that you won, and I'm excited that we were able to give it away. So what you're getting is a full set of the Rocket Math games, and so a full classroom set, and there they are. You don't want them. You want me to draw for someone else? <laughs> I don't want that. I don't just, I just guys. So, and that was compliments of Don Crawford and Rocket Math. So. If you all have had half as much fun as I have this week, then you've had tons of fun because this really has been a great week. Um, seeing the newer people connecting and learning more about direct instruction, um, the hard work that was going into the program training sessions, the great discussions that I was hearing in some of the other sessions, it's just a, really a testament to your dedication and I appreciate you giving up a week of your summer to spend it in sometimes hot, sometimes cold facility like this, um, but it's very gratifying. I'd like to thank all the trainers that put in many hours ahead of time in preparation and giving their expertise to this conference. Wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for all these people to come in from out of town if it weren't for you trainers. So thanks for your dedication and hard work. The staff from Nifty that put in so much to make this a success. Um, Tamara Bressi, Rochelle Davison, Pat, Pleate, uh, Christina Cox, Nathan Engelman, Nathan Engelman, Alexa Engelman for staffing the store. Um, just a great group of people. Kurt Engelman for uh, having the, the foresight and, uh, and the confidence to move ahead with this conference when uh, it needed a sponsor. And so thanks to all of you for, for what you put into this conference. Again, a round of applause for them. And that's about it that I can do for thanks. Um, I think we just want to go straight ahead and uh, invite Zig to do his, uh, <coughs> excuse me, closing talk. And then we'll have the grand prize, door prize drawing. So come on up, Zig. Like previous conferences, this one, is sort of a mixed bag in that it seems like it's never going to end when it begins. It seems like this is overwhelming, here we go, and then we turn around four times and here we are at the closing. And it seems like, what, it's over? Yeah, it's over. I mean, this is it. And this has been a very good year. I thought that the people that, that I talked to showed Amazing interest in what they're doing, and uh, it seemed like a really good group, uh, particularly the new people. Yeah. So here we go. In the opening, I mentioned that uh, the Common Core standards have serious problems. Well, in the programs we're developing for reading and math and language, we meet the Common Core standards, and we do it in K-5 in math, language, and literature. We meet them all, and uh, some of them are not much fun to meet. You wouldn't want to meet some of those in a dark alley, I'm telling you. Uh, we do so in a way that makes the teaching manageable 
and teachable and it does not erode the integrity of the program. That is a primary consideration. We're not going to destroy the program to put in some silly standard. Example, and I'll go through the examples we had before, ask and answer questions about unknown words and text. We do that literally with written sentences, each having an unknown known word. For example, she said some inane things. Okay, they read the sentence, and then we ask them, uh, do you, uh, you know, do you know all the words in that sentence? No, what word don't you know? Inane. Okay, ask a question about what inane means. Go ahead. What does inane mean? Inane means stupid or silly. <laughs> what does inane mean? Stupid or silly. Okay, great. Say the sentence with another word for a name. Go ahead. Good. <laughs> All right, and that's it. And then we just do that with a lot of examples. And uh, that's not a bad task as it is. I mean, it's in kindergarten. And, you know, that's kind of like uh, questionable about whether you'd want to do it in the first place. But it's not going to hurt anything. It's not going to erode the program or uh, take a great deal of time. Another example, one we gave earlier. Children write numbers 1 through 20. Wow. Well, we teach children to write numbers 1 through 100. Okay? Uh, in a proper sequence. In other words, we don't start with... The two-digit numbers, 11, 12, those are the last ones we deal with. That we deal with the, the generalizable two-digit numbers like 74, and then we work on back and do the, the zero numbers, 20s, 40s, and all those. And then we finally hit the teens, and we point out to them, uh, these are kind of weird, they're backwards, but... You know all the other numbers, so if they look weird, it's probably a teen number. Here we go. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so we teach them in that order. Uh, we teach 1 through 20. We just don't stop there or start there. But when it's all over, have we taught 1 through 20? Yes. Okay. Another example, children isolate and pronounce sounds in CVC words. The solution we use is the same as the 1 through 20. What would that be? Hmm? Yeah, teach them all. <laughs> teach them all word types. Teach whatever words are going to come up in what they read. If it's a two-sound word, it's a two-sound word. If it's a four-sound word, it's a four-sound word. And if it's a CVC, it's as if CVC, and we don't give a DAM. <laughs> okay. All right, next page here. Oh dear, this starts the, uh, the main part, sort of. Uh, <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. Who lies? in education, legions of educational policymakers and experts. Why they lie, why they lie. I thought about that question and I kept coming up with blanks. I wanted something that really expressed their, their motivation and their motivation is very strange, very odd, very unusual, but uh, after a while, I started thinking and suddenly a verse popped out and, and turn a single page. Here we go. It is. They have a model of how things should be and that's more important than reality. <laughs> okay, listen again. They have a model of how things should be, and that's more important than reality. Say it with me. They have a model of how things should be, and that's more important than reality. All right. And that's true. I mean, unfortunately, their lies reveal that it is more important for them 
to preserve their flawed understanding about how kids learn than it is to provide effective instruction for kids who will have bleak lives without help. I mean, they are not really thinking about the kids at all, only the kids that are filtered through their perverse notions of what should be and what constitutes reality. <laughs> uh, no kidding. I mean, it's really weird. And, um, but I've seen so many examples of it. I know it, that that's probably the way it is. Their logic goes something like this. Direct instruction is at odds with my model of the mind and learning, which is built around, often, discovery. If I accept data showing that DI works, I will have to acknowledge that discovery and my model of learning is flawed. I can't do that, so I'll lie about whether DI works. And they do. Blatant, flat lies from the beginning. This reasoning has affected hundreds of millions of kids since 1970. And uh, Project Follow Through is probably the, the most uh, blatant example of this kind of thinking. Uh, Project Follow Through is the largest educational experiment ever conducted. It involved comparisons of different models of how to teach kids. And each model was implemented with fidelity in its schools, where it was the only model in that school. And we worked with 22 different communities, a whole heck of a lot of schools. Some of them had as many as seven or eight schools. And uh, we implemented DI, and the project went on for 10 years before it was evaluated, 10 years. So we were able to shake it down, shape it up, and here we go. And uh, what happened was, in this experiment, the DI model outperformed all other models in everything measured. And that was the problem right there. We beat them in everything. They had divided models up into different classes, and they put reinforcement type over here, over here. And uh, that included DI, because that was a basic skill model. <laughs> I mean, boo, basic skill. OK. And then they had the cognitive skills, front and center here, cognitive skills. And that they had a whole bunch of models that didn't agree with each other or often with themselves about what constituted their model. But uh, th they had different cognitive models and then different effective models, those based on the idea that students would learn better if they felt better about themselves. So the name of the game was to make themselves feel good about themselves. And, Positive attitudes lead to positive behavior and more learning. Okay, well, it didn't tend to work that way because we beat every, everybody in the effective, in the cognitive, and in the basics. I mean, we whumped them. Uh, and so they decided, after the data came in, and we had gone at it for 10 years, that they would not disseminate results on the outcome of the, of the experiment. That rather they would say, um, follow through failed because the models didn't do well. And that was true of, of most of them. But I mean, come on, man. And so here's a perfect example of what was more important to them. The commissioner of education uh, said that follow through was not designed to show winners and losers. I mean, which is a flat lie from the beginning. It was advertised as a horse race and the best models would win. And uh, the, the, he said the feds could not endorse DI 
because there was only one winner. We have this quote in a letter that he wrote. And we can't, we can't call anybody a winner because there was only one winner. In other words, it didn't fit their model of how it should work. It didn't hit their expectations. So you, you have to ask yourself, though, in real life and in a non-political sense, and I'm sure this was highly political uh, decision to say nobody won, uh, that what is more important to decision makers using data from follow through to serve millions of kids who are failing or reject all data on the grounds that outcomes didn't match their expectations of what should happen. I mean, their expectations are more important than the fact that millions of kids could have been saved if they used DI. So um, that, that was, you know, one hell of a whopper right there. That was one of what we call, well, in, in the hospital trade, uh, one bitter ass pill. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's, there's more than one way to lie. And the most common way to lie. It goes on with school districts all the time. School district does this. They, the test results come out and show that this district is really low performing. And so there's a little hubbub, little talk about it. And then they go on doing what? Exactly what they did before. No changes, just let's go on and proceed as normal, have the same talks, have the same prejudices, do the same things in the classrooms. You acknowledge the facts and ignore all implications and continue as before. But that's what it's supposed to be all about, is to operate on the implications of the facts, to treat them as if they're serious, as if you really wanted to know the truth and that the truth has power to serve kids. So Arne Duncan and DI in Chicago, Arne Duncan is um, he's the commissioner of education. He plays handball with Brock. So uh, that's how they got to know each other. And he was summa cum laude from Harvard. And so you'd think, this is kind of a bright guy, right? And he has done the dumbest things in Chicago that you can imagine. I mean, brain dead things and cruel things. Like uh, he hired this Easton, I can't remember her married name, but she was Easton. And she had this classroom, Dunbar, um, I, I'm sorry, a school, Dunbar. And it went from all the, like all, all of the ghetto schools in Chicago perform at, you know, like the 17th percentile or what. And it went from there up to the 65th, the 70th percentile. Holy cow, it did it in one year, one year, one year, and in all grades. Now anybody with even a skeptical or a hazy understanding of how it works, should know that that's really not very possible. I mean, because that would mean, yeah, you could accelerate the kids in K and one, one year, accelerate them, teach them 150% of what they had been learning, and they would be above average, and that's achievable. You can do that. You can teach that much in one year. But what do you do about fourth graders who are performing on average in maybe the second grade level? You're gonna teach them all of second grade stuff, all of the third grade stuff, all of the fourth grade stuff in one year? I don't think so. But yet here these scores all jumped up and they believed she was the savior. So she went in and we had schools we'd been working with in Chicago forever. And she threw all those out, all DI out of the city. And then later she was involved in uh, the selection for that uh, 
what is it called, that research, um, come on, uh, yes, yeah, striving reader research in grades six through eight, and that was a categorical failure. And she finally left and took a position when, it, when the heat started to come on, because then people began to suspect, hey, maybe this lady ain't the hotshot teacher that uh, she posed to be, and maybe the things that we're doing like this, you know, like... Uh,